So in order to understand the cancer drugs, you first have to understand the big picture of the cell cycle. Now this video is definitely not going to be a very in-depth uh, cellular biology video, but instead I'll just kind of breeze through this. And if you're having any trouble understanding the cell cycle, I would encourage you to stop this video now and learn about the cell cycle before you attempt to learn about the drugs that act on the cell cycle. It makes a little bit of sense that you should probably start with the basics before you learn the pharmacology. So in the cell cycle, you have mitosis, which we'll call the M phase. And then you have the G1 phase, the S phase, and the G2 phase. Now in each of these phases, something's happening. And in mitosis, ultimately you get the splitting of the cell. This is stuff that's been crammed into your brain uh, since before medical school, well into undergraduate school, you should have a very good understanding of what mitosis is. But ultimately, mitosis will lead to the cell splitting into two. Now, in the G1 phase, that's next, and this is where the cell contents get duplicated. This is followed by S phase, which is where the DNA is actually synthesized. And then in the G2 phase, this is sort of like a maintenance phase where the DNA gets double checked to make sure that there are no errors. And we'll talk about this toward the end of the video uh, and talk about exactly what acts on the G2 phase and we'll make sense of all this stuff as we go through. So there, the way that I want to move through this video is to talk about the drugs that affect each of these categories one at a time. And then at the end, we'll talk about drugs that don't really fit into any of these four different phases. And we'll talk about those at the very end of the video. So let's get started with the anti-cancer drugs that act on mitosis, so they act on the M phase. Now those four drugs are listed here. It's vincristine, vinblastine, paclitaxel, and irubilin. So we're talking about M phase inhibitors, or inhibitors of mitosis. Now briefly, just recall that in mitosis, there is a process whereby you have the formation of something called the mitotic spindle. And in that mitotic spindle, you have these sister chromatids that align right across this horizontal line and they get pulled apart. What, what actually is doing this pulling are microtubules. So the way that these drugs act on the M phase is some of them specifically are going to inhibit microtubules. And by inhibiting microtubules, they can never rip apart the sister chromatids that lay on the mitotic spindle and therefore the cell can't divide. And if you have a cancer cell that can't divide, these drugs prevent the spread of cancerous cells. So that's sort of the big overview of how these drugs are working. Now the ones that you need to be familiar with for USMLE and for Comlex are vincristine and vinblastine, which I'll sort of talk about as one drug because they, they're pretty much the same drug, paclitaxel and irubilin. So for the purposes of exams, you should know that vincristine and vinblastine are basically the same thing. The mechanisms throughout this video are going to be shown in red, adverse drug reactions will be shown in blue, and treatment for adverse drug reactions will be shown in green. And of course, I'll summarize as we go. So the mechanism here of these mitosis phase inhibitors is that vincristine slash vinblastine is going to bind to something called beta tubulin and prevent polymerization in the microtubule. Paclitaxel is going to hyperstabilize the M phase. So basically, it's going to just lock it into the M phase and not let it get out, and it does that by acting on microtubules. The irubilin is going to bind to the high affinity end of the microtubule and prevent it from doing its job because it's sort of just like an added component sitting on the microtubule. Now, one point of distinction, which I'm going to put here in parentheses, is that vincristine and vinblastine prevent the formation of the mitotic spindle or the formation of microtubules because they're preventing, <clears throat> they're preventing polymerization. But paclitaxel is preventing the breakdown of it because it's hyper-stabilizing it. Therefore, if it's super stable, it can't be broken down. And if it can't be broken down, recycled, and processed, inside of the cell, then you're not going to be able to carry out the normal function that relies on the microtubule. So if I can pause for just a second, I want you to take away from this that vincristine slash vinblastine are basically the same drug for the purposes of exams, and they prevent the formation by binding to beta tubulin and preventing polymerization. Paclitaxel will hyperstabilize uh, the M phase because it's going to prevent breakdown. Irubilin is going to bind to the high ends of the microtubules, the high affinity ends of the microtubules, and prevent them from doing their job. Now, some side effects that you need to know for exam. So vincristine and vinblastine are going to cause neurotoxicity. Paclitaxel will cause neuropathy, and irubilin will cause arthralgia. So how do you remember this stuff? I think you're going to need some mnemonics. So 
the way that I learned this when I was in medical school was uh, I, I told a little story here. Now, if you're not familiar with U.S. politics and, you know, scandals and such, then this mnemonic might not work for you. And I apologize. But if you are familiar, then maybe you remember uh, a governor of New Jersey called Chris Christie. And what happened was years back, Chris Christie was involved in something called Bridgegate, where he intentionally caused a traffic jam on the George Washington Bridge going from New Jersey to New York. And this was politically motivated. And the, the reason that I use this as the beginning of the story is because Chris Christie sounds like Vin Christine. And he was a very toxic governor. So I think of toxicity or neurotoxicity. I also think about this tying into microtube is because microtubules are all about motion within a cell, and he was involved in Bridgegate, which prevented motion across the GW Bridge. And if you look at the GW Bridge, the little spokes that go up the bridge even look like microtubules. So I think that this story really ties nicely together. So the way that I kick this off is that Vin Christine, aka Chris Christie, is really toxic, so it causes neurotoxicity. I can tie in that this story and Vin Christine and all of the drugs associated with this story have to do with microtubules because microtubules are responsible for motion within a cell, and Chris Christie caused Bridgegate, which stopped all motion on the George Washington Bridge. Now, when motion was stopped, you had to get some taxis, and I tie taxis into paclitaxel because taxel, taxi, sounds very, very similar. So I think about that in this story, paclitaxel also is involved with microtubules because it ties into this story because it sounds like the taxi, which had to therefore drive people through an alternate route because of Chris Christie, AKA Vin Christine, stopping motion on the George Washington Bridge. So you had paclitaxel or paclitaxis also involved with microtubules because they're taking the passengers an alternate route. So that's how I tie in paclitaxel to the microtubule story. And then when people realized what happened, they were really pissed off. They did not like Chris Christie and he got booed. And you can see that we're going to Eru Eribulin, 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 uh, reminds me of booze, booing Chris Christie or booing Vin Christine. And therefore Eribulin acts on microtubules. So I tie all of this together and that's how I remember that these are the drugs that act on microtubules. Now, the other thing to know here is that irubilin is gonna cause arthralgias. And if you think about this, when somebody's booing and they're holding up a sign that says boo, they might get some pain in their wrists. That's an arthralgia. Um, no real good way of learning that neuropathy is the side effect for paclitaxel, just memorize it. But if, you, but if you put all this stuff together and you're having trouble memorizing that these drugs act on microtubules, then you've got this really cool story about uh, Vin Christine, aka Chris Christie, being a really, really bad governor of New Jersey and causing all this mess. So that's how I remember that these all have to do with microtubules. I know that Chris Christie is toxic, so Vin Christine is neurotoxic. Uh, if you hold up a sign that says boo on it, arubilin will cause arthralgias in your wrist. And then I always memorize that paclitaxel causes neuropathy. So those are the three drugs, four drugs, if you will, that inhibit mitosis. Now let's move on and talk about the drugs that inhibit the G1 phase. So those are going to be cisplatin, busulfin, cyclophosphamide, and the nitrosurea. So these are our G1 phase inhibitors. And you need to know these four drugs, right? Cisplatin, busulfin, cyclophosphamide, and carmustine. Carmustine is a nitrosurea. Uh, nitrosurea is like the name of the category, and then the specific agent is carmustine. So here are the mechanisms. These all cross-link DNA. So pretty easy because they all do the same thing. The only little caveat that you need to know is with cyclophosphamide and carmustine. So cyclophosphamide will cross-link DNA specifically at guanine, and it requires hepatic bioactivation. Carmustine, on the other hand, crosses the blood-brain barrier and requires that its bioactivation occurs in the brain so that it can be used on CNS tumors, right? So neurologic tumors, tumors of the brain. So carmustine crosses the blood-brain barrier and is activated in the brain. Cyclophosphamide cross-links DNA at guanine specifically and must undergo bioactivation by the liver. Busulfin and cisplatin, all you need to memorize is that they cross-link DNA. So the, the most high yield thing about these G1 agents are actually the side effects. So what you see here in blue, cisplatin will cause ototoxicity and nephrotoxicity. Busulfin will cause pulmonary fibrosis. Cyclophosphamide will cause both a hemorrhagic cystitis, which is very serious, and SIADH.
carmustine will cause central nervous system toxicity, which makes sense because it's used uh, for tumors of the brain and it crosses the blood brain barrier and gets activated in the brain. So, you know, it, it should make sense to you that the side effects will all occur in the brain. Some high yield stuff that we need to point out is that we can actually treat some of these side effects. So in the case of cisplatin, you can prevent nephrotoxicity if you give a drug called amifostine or saline or both. So by giving amifostine and saline, you prevent the nephrotoxicity associated with cisplatin. And in the case of cyclophosphamide, if hemorrhagic cystitis occurs, you treat with a drug called mesna. I always loved this point because mesna is such a unique sounding agent. And if you're going to treat hemorrhagic cystitis, you use mesna. So there have to be some mnemonics in order to remember these high yield adverse drug reactions. And I've got some awesome ones for you. So for cisplatin, it makes the kidney go splat and splat is in the name cisplatin. So, you know, splat, cisplatin makes the kidney go splat. So it causes nephrotoxicity and we treat that nephrotoxicity with amifostine and saline. Busulfan causes pulmonary fibrosis. And this is one of two anti-cancer drugs that will cause pulmonary fibrosis. And conveniently, the other one also begins with the letter B. Now, in the case of this, we're going to memorize pulmonary fibusulfan instead of pulmonary fibrosis. So we just replace the second part of the word with busulfan because fibrosis maybe sounds like fibrosulfan a little bit. Cyclophosphamide, well, this has the most serious adverse drug reaction of all the G1 inhibitors. And if you look in the name, cyclophosphamide has HOSP in the middle. So you have to go to the hospital if you get hemorrhagic cystitis because it's the most serious adverse drug reaction acutely of any of those on uh, the G1 inhibitors. So if you give cyclophosphamide, you might have to go to the HOSP hospital, which is in the name of the drug, if you get hemorrhagic cystitis. So on exams, if, if someone has cancer and all of a sudden they're urinating blood, the answer is cyclophosphamide, you treat it with mesna. That's it. And for carmustine, it must cross the blood brain barrier and must is in the name carmustine. So these are some really awesome mnemonics that you can use by looking at the name of the drug and keeping things simple. Okay. So if you're wondering for one second, I want to pause and take a step back here. If you're wondering, how am I going to remember that these four agents are in the G1 uh, inhibitor section. Well, by understanding the cell cycle and knowing that in G1, all of your cellular contents get duplicated by cross-linking DNA, none of that can happen. So if you understand what happens at G1 and what happens at S and what happens at G2, and you can also memorize or understand or use mnemonics to know the mechanisms, then this should all fall into place. So by cross-linking DNA, cellular contents will not be duplicated, which means G1 won't happen. So if you know cross-linking DNA for these four agents, you'll have no problem memorizing the G1 agents. Now, the hardest category to memorize is our next category, and that's the S phase. And this is where DNA synthesis occurs. The agents that you need to know are azathioprine, cladribine, cytarabine, 5-fluorouracil, 6-mercaptopurine, hydroxyurea, and methotrexate. And I'm going to do my best to simplify this for you, but this is definitely the toughest category because it's got seven drugs. So we're talking about the S phase inhibitors, and here are our seven agents. Now, instead of throwing up all of the mechanisms at once, I want to go through these methodically to help your brain digest this information. So azothioprine and 6-mercaptopurine are basically the same thing for the purposes of exams because azothioprine actually gets metabolized into 6 mp when it's broken down. So both of these agents are going to inhibit de novo purine synthesis. And if you look at the name mercaptopurine, azothioprine, that's hinting that these are going to inhibit purine synthesis because you know that they're somehow involved with purines because of the names. Now, both of these are activated by HGPRT. And interestingly, and extremely high yieldly, if that's a word, these are metabolized by xanthine oxidase. We're going to come back to this when we talk about adverse drug reactions. But for now, just deposit that little tidbit in the back of your brain. Azathioprine and 6 mercaptopurine are both metabolized by xanthine oxidase. Now, if you look at the other part of the slide, we'll, slide, we'll switch gears and talk about cladribine and cytarabine. So cladribine is a purine analog. Look at the name, ribine. So that's, you know, it's hinting that it's a purine. Cytarabine, it's hinting that it's a pyrimidine, right? Look at the Y, cytarabine. 
Okay, so so the names can tell you a lot if you're if you're stuck or you're, you 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 find an exam question tricky. Methotrexate is going to inhibit dihydrofolate reductase. We'll come back to this because there's a very very high yield adverse drug reaction and treatment that we'll talk about. 5-fluorouracil is going to be a pyrimidine analog. Look at the name. It's 5-fluorouracil. So it's an analog that's of a pyrimidine, and it specifically inhibits thimidylate synthase. Lastly, hydroxyurea inhibits ribonucleotide reductase. So now let's talk about the high-yield adverse drug reactions. And as a sort, sort of a theme throughout the anti-cancer drug series, uh, any question that you get is most likely to ask you about adverse drug reactions. Now, don't get me wrong, they can certainly ask you about mechanisms or treatments of adverse drug reactions, but they're going to probably go after those ADRs, so, so be sure that you know them. Here's what, here's what we got. So for azathioprine and 6-mercaptopurine, I told you that they were both metabolized by xanthine oxidase. So if you give a drug such as allopurinol or febuxostat, which both have mechanisms of inhibiting xanthine oxidase, then you're inhibiting the enzyme that breaks down azothioprine and 6-mercaptopurine. So if you give one of these cancer drugs and you give allopurinol or febuxostat, then azothioprine and 6-mercaptopurine will not be broken down because xanthine oxidase is inhibited by the allopurinol. So on exams, this will come up as a patient who they either hint at that has cancer or is a previous cancer patient, and then all of a sudden, they're given some drug um, and there's massive side effects or massive toxicity. And what they're hinting at here is that you have this cancer patient who may or may not have been or is on azothioprine or 6-mercaptopurine, and now they're getting allopurinol, and maybe the question will be really nice to you and describe a sort of gouty, arthralgic presentation, and you need to figure out what these drugs are, or maybe they'll ask you a question about, you know, like which of the following is the mechanism or the pathophysiology by which this is occurring. So it's, it's really random because you're going to read this question. It's going to be a question that's either about cellular biology or oncology, and then they're going to tie it into a drug that treats gout. Your, your brain is going to be blown when you're taking the exam because you're going to be like, what the hell are they asking me? But if you stop for a second and understand that azathioprine and 6-mercaptopurine are both metabolized by xanthine oxidase, then you'll be able to tie this together on test day. For methotrexate, the high-yield adverse drug reaction is myelosuppression. Now, let me pause for a second. If you're looking through First Aid or any other review textbook or, you know, UWorld, whatever it is, you'll notice that every single anti-cancer drug has myelosuppression as an adverse drug reaction. And what I'm going to tell you is that none of those drugs you should memorize myelosuppression for. Literally erase it from your brain because nonspecific adverse drug reactions will not be asked on USMLE or complex. But this is the one exception, and that's why it's exceptionally high yield, no pun intended. Because in the case of methotrexate, it does cause myelosuppression, but this is the one example where you can actually treat that myelosuppression. So if you give somebody methotrexate and induce myelosuppression as an adverse drug reaction, you give them a drug called leucovorin, and it actually treats the myelosuppression. But for literally every other anti-cancer drug, which is gonna inhibit some part of the cell cycle and therefore obviously suppress the myeloid lineage, then yeah, there's, you know, there's nothing to memorize there. It causes myelosuppression, but they can't ask you that because every drug does that. So only memorize myelosuppression for methotrexate and know that you treat it with leucovorin. For cladribine, it causes nephro and neurotoxicity. For cytarabine, it causes pancytopenia, which is easy to remember because the Y in pancytopedia the Y in pyrimidine analog, and the Y in cytarabine. So it all goes together with the Y. 5-fluorouracil causes hand-foot syndrome, which is basically just like reddening of the hands and feet. Very, very high yield. I'll, I'll give you an awesome mnemonic for this in just a second. And for hydroxyurea, there's no adverse drug reaction that you should memorize. It's more important to know the mechanism. So let me give you some mnemonics for these things. So for azothioprine, I want you to spell it out azothioprine, but spell it with an XO. And that XO will remind you that it's metabolized by xanthine oxidase. X for xanthine, O for oxidase. For methotrexate, I want you to write it out as methodrexate. And DR will tell you that it inhibits dihydrofolate reductase. So D for dihydrofolate and R for reductase. Also, again, know that it causes myelosuppression, treatable with leucovorin. 
For cytarabine, again, it's all the whys, right? Why in pancytopenia, why in pyrimidine analog, and why in cytarabine? This is the only drug where it all has whys. For hydroxyurea, I want you to write it out with two R's at the end, hydroxyurea. RR for ribonucleotide reductase to help you memorize the mechanism. And then for hand foot syndrome, well, the drug is 5-fluorouracil, and that is commonly referred to as 5-FU. And when you say FU to somebody, you flip them off, and it causes reddening of the hands, which is known as hand foot syndrome. So flipping somebody off or saying FU for 5-FU reminds me that it's the hand, because the hand is what you use to flip somebody off, it's the hand that gets red as the adverse drug reaction. So really awesome, high yield, adverse drug reaction and mnemonic. So know all this stuff. The S inhibitors are really, really high yield because there's so many of them, but I, th I think that I broke it down rather nicely. So know what you have here on this slide. So that's the S phase. Let's wrap up with uh, the G2 phase. So the agents that you need to know in the G2 phase, atoposide, teniposide, irinotecan and topotecan. Now the G2 inhibitors are actually fairly simple because for the purposes of exams, these are basically just two drugs. Teniposide and atoposide are basically one drug, right? They're like the same thing. They all end in poside. And topotecan and irinotecan also should be considered one drug. They both end in otecan. So there's a very clear delineation here. The ones that end in poside, right? Teniposide and etoposide, inhibit topoisomerase 2. The ones that end in otecan or tecan inhibit topoisomerase 1. So clearly, if you look at the names here, you've got topo, you've got tenipo, etopo, irino, like they all have O's and stuff. So it should cue you in to know that we're talking about topoisomerase. The hard thing here is knowing which one causes, it inhibits topoisomerase 2 and which one inhibits topoisomerase 1. And the way that you can memorize this is to think of a posse. So a posse is like a slang term for a crew of people, right? Like, yo, where's your posse at? Like your group of friends that are all doing the same thing, that's a posse. And in teniposide and etoposide, you've got the word posse, right? T teni posse dot d, o eto posse d, or etoposide, right? Like I'm spelling it phonetically, but the word posse is there. So in teniposide and etoposide, because posse is in the name, that inhibits topoisomerase 2 because a posse of people is two or more people. So it's going to be DNA topoisomerase 2 for the ones that have posse in the name because a posse is at least two people. That's how I memorize that. Really, really easy. And then if you know that, then by process of elimination, topotecan and irinotecan must inhibit DNA topoisomerase 1. Now, if you're wondering, how the heck do I remember that these inhibit the G2 phase? Well, the G2 phase is the DNA double check phase. And basically, DNA topoisomerase goes through and double checks that the DNA is wound correctly. Because sometimes it gets wound so tightly that the DNA topoisomerase has to like backtrack a little and fix it. So because it's double checking it in the G2 phase, you know that anything that inhibits DNA topoisomerase obviously works in the G2 phase. And you should know that if you studied cellular biology. Uh, so you should be good to go, assuming that you got the basics down. So those are all the drugs in these four categories. There's one more category that doesn't fit onto this slide that we'll talk about now. And, and these are the anti-tumor antibiotics. And of course, um, these are going to be identifiable because the names actually sound like names of antibiotics. So we've got doxorubicin and danorubicin, which we will consider one drug for the purpose of USMLE and Comlex, and bleomycin. Doxorubicin and danorubicin are going to work by intercalating DNA, and bleomycin is going to work by generating free radicals, which, of course, if you generate free radicals against DNA or any substance, then the cell can't divide, and therefore cancerous cells can't divide. The adverse drug reactions here, um, dilated cardiomyopathy for doxorubicin and pulmonary fibrosis for bleomycin. So remember that busulfan also caused pulmonary fibrosis. So the ones that begin with B cause pulmonary, cause pulmonary fibrosis. And you can remember that by replacing the rest of the word fibrosis with whatever the drug is. So for busulfan, we said the mnemonic was pulmonary fibusulfan. And in this case, the mnemonic is pulmonary fibliomycin. So fibrosis, you know, just remember the B in fibrosis should cue you that the drug is either bleomycin, which has a B, or busulfan, which has a B. For doxorubicin, it causes dilated cardiomyopathy. And this is so high yield. I cannot stress this enough. On exams, the way that this will present is you'll have a patient who they might hint at is either a cancer patient or a, you know, a cancer survivor. 
And then all of a sudden, they're going to try to hint at some type of cardiomyopathy. They might give you heart failure. They might give you like, you know, stroke volumes and afterloads and, and weird graphs that you're going to have to interpret. But the bottom line is going to be that there's going to be a very clear cardiomyopathic process. And what they're going to ask you is either A, what's the drug? Answer would be doxorubicin. B, what's the mechanism of the drug? Answer would be intercalation of DNA. C, what is going on? Answer would be dilated cardiomyopathy. Or D, what's the treatment? In which case you should know that you treat dilated cardiomyopathy that's induced by doxorubicin by giving a drug called dexrazoxane. So this is really high yield. Cannot stress it enough. Know the drugs that know the anti-cancer drugs that have adverse drug reactions that are treatable. So we talked about a few today. We talked about doxorubicin. We talked about cyclophosphamide. We talked about cisplatin. So amifostine for cisplatin, mesna for cyclophosphamide, uh, dexrazoxane for doxorubicin. And we also talked about methotrexate. Remember, myelosuppression is the only one that you should memorize myelosuppression for is methotrexate which was treatable with leucovorin. So know those four, know the four adverse drug reactions and know what you treat them with. But that's it, right? So we, we are now done. We've covered all the anti-cancer drugs that you should know. There are a couple more that I didn't include in this lecture, but they're not nearly as high yield as the ones in this lecture. So if you know your cellular biology, you know the cell cycle, you understand a little bit about what DNA topoisomerase does and you know what happens in G1, G2, S, mitosis, and then you know this video, you'll be very well suited to either dive deeper into this topic or just to superficially try to answer some questions and leave it at that. But that's it, and I hope this was helpful to you.